yeah, so the first part will be, of course, today, and then due to the holiday on Monday, uh, Memorial Day, and, and before we really get into our presentation, may I take this opportunity to thank all of those who have served in our military and for those who have family members that have served and have lost loved ones uh, and family members. Uh, that's what this Memorial Day is about. So uh, our blessings and gratitude for all of those who have served and, and for families of those who have served. Thank you. Monday the 28th, as a reflection of Memorial Day, is a holiday. And so our two-part follow-up webinar will be Wednesday, May 30th, which will be an awesome time to go over what we uh, have covered in this session, number one, and also uh, expand upon a couple developments that are underway, which we'll, we'll reveal or talk about uh, as this presentation uh, gets underway. Please take a moment to uh, review this risk disclosure. Trading is risky. Past performance is not indicative of future results. And again, stops do not necessarily limit your losses due to market conditions, a.k.a. namely gap moves against us on openings. All right. Now, uh, many of you, if you've seen me at either private uh, seminars or if you've seen me at Traders Expo or if you've seen any of my work that I've done uh, through the years, I call it my 12-point uh, trading uh, methodology. And part of the ones that we're going to go over for today is one that we've talked about in the past and one we use at, um, at lengths. And one it, it even covered in a book I wrote called Mastering the Stock Market back in 2012. I can't believe that was six years ago. Uh, it was written during 2011, so I guess you want to say it's seven years old. Lucky seven. Anyway, relative strength, and we created an indicator which now is on and has been available on Thinkorswim for the last few months, and we'll talk about that. It's called the PMC, Person Market Catcher. It's a relative strength analysis tool. It's phenomenal. Um, it really helps us to understand the four different conditions that the market that you're using or looking at as it compares to the underlying uh, market of the S&P 500. We'll get into that in a minute. And volume analysis. Um, many of you are quite familiar with my work through um, the 2000s in 07, 8, and 9. Maybe you saw quite some of my shtick about giving a, a promotion with the on-balance volume indicator. And uh, now we have a different volume indicator that we use. It measures rates of change of the momentum of the volume in terms of percent change. It's very powerful, and we'll talk about that as well. And then lastly, not just money management, but it seems to be a big topic nowadays. It's popping up, but one of the uh, things that we've been dealing with is called, and many of you are familiar with this, is called risk-reward ratio. Um, an intricate study was made during uh, many uh, years of my back testing of certain patterns, namely the high-closed doji. Uh, we had a, a situation where we found a very strong relative relationship of success or probability of success and outcome using a one-to-one -one risk reward ratio on a lot of signals, which is counterintuitive to what we all have heard about using at least a three-to-one risk reward ratio. But using profit to loss ratios, is it really a set figure that you can use for buy signals as well as sell signals? So this is a very powerful thought process, so I'll repeat this again. Can we utilize the same parameters or risk-reward ratios for buy signals as we can sell signals? That's a, a, a pretty powerful statement, and we've got some information I think you'd be intrigued to learn about. So uh, instead of getting into opinions, we're going to talk more factually on this situation. And then finally, we talked about not just the um, patterns. What are we seeing? I talked about high close doji, low close dojis, but I use them as their, my number two point. So in not terms of what the, the most that I use, but I use obviously PPS indicators because I can scan easily, as it says here. And yes, this is a very old slide. Uh, so we haven't changed our shtick, so to speak, or our methodologies. I think what we've done is been able to utilize more back testing results uh, as we move into 
um, more markets to trade. And what do I mean by more markets to trade? Well, we got pot stocks now. We never had that 20 years ago. Um, we've got cryptocurrencies uh, now become more legitimized, so to speak, in, in the Bitcoin era. Remember, we were talking about over a year ago trading the GBTC, the Bitcoin over-the-counter stock uh, product. GBTC was a symbol when not many people were quite familiar with it. So we've been cutting edge, looking at different things to trade. And of course, lastly, um, we have a ton of volatility products to trade. And we'll talk about a little bit about that as well. So as you can see, we have a lot of topics to cover in this webinar, which is why we've broken it down into a two-part series to help users both with um, Thinkorswim, Genesis Trade Navigator, and uh, you will note that next week we will talk about Trade Navigator and how we integrate three platforms together, Thinkorswim, Trade Navigator, Genesis, and of course, TradeStation. So again, this would require a two-part series, if not a, a longer term uh, seminar. I wanted to also point out, everyone, that many of you are familiar with the person's pivots. It is a, an advanced system that does help us which used a moving average to help us define the tr define not find but define the trend <laughs> direction and help us to determine support and resistance most time frames so with that stated it's kind of interesting because I did this presentation and I, I thought it'd be nice to share this with you uh, when we did this in New York at the Traders Expo and I also introduced this to other people in a private seminar but it's kind of funny. A lot of people are familiar with Wells Wilder. He was the creator of relative strength index, not relative strength comparative analysis, but the RSI. He was the creator of RSI, the ADX, the directional movement indicator plus minus. Some people call it DMX, but it's DMI. And again, the ATR, which stands for average true range, the ATR calculation. He's mostly famous as people use the RSI as an oscillator for overbought, oversold market conditions. But what a lot of people don't know about is that Wells Wilder also used pivot points in his calculations. That's right, pivot points, like as in floor traders pivots. Funny thing about Wells Wilder, people don't know this, is he wasn't really a stock trader. He was mostly a commodity trader. So it was kind of interesting. He made adjustments for his indicators for limit up moves, and that's where ATR was helpful in determining uh, ranges that had no, uh, or, or trading sessions that had no ranges. They just opened at the limit, and so therefore there was no high or low, it was just one print. It's where the market opened, it's where the market closed. There was no trading limit or trading range due to the fact that it was trading at limit up conditions. So uh, pivots have been around a long time. Wells Wilder called his pivot system called, it was called the, the trend reaction system, or reaction trend system. Um, and with um, just taking a, a copy of this out of a, a book that he had written years ago, um, you'll notice that the, it doesn't say pivot points or floor traders, but you will see where X, his formulas, is high low close divided by three. And that, my friends, is the pivot point formula you will notice down below that this is the uh, targeting uh, price equation. Two times uh, the pivot minus the low add the high back is how we determine the support and resistance targets for the floor traders pivots. And he called them something else. So um, kind of interesting how he used for the formula for R1 and S1. Many people might not know about this in the annals of history of technical analysis, but it just goes to show that some of our most famous technicians' work has been abandoned by others, and, and yet this was uh, a system that probably wasn't widely followed because there were too many rules. There were lots of rules. I mean, when I say lots of rules, there were lots of rules, so I'm not sure if they were as subjective as most, but I think maybe we had seen that there's, besides looking at pivots, there were better things to utilize. Better things to utilize. Meaning, maybe there were other technical tools that we could incorporate that helped give better confirmation 
then come up with more trading rules. Now let's move forward into the, the new millennium. John Person comes running around and Trade Navigator, Genesis Software, says, you know, Person, we've seen your work before. Um, you know, you say that when the pivot point is above the moving average of the pivot that you created, that it says if the short-term moving average is above a, a longer-term moving average. In other words, if the short-term moving average is greater than a longer-term moving average, okay, shorter term is S, if the moving average of the shorter term is greater than the longer-term moving average, then it is bullish. Now, most of you would understand that, yes, if a short-term moving average is up and a longer-term moving average is up and the market is above those moving averages, it's a positive market condition. Therefore, we can look to be buyers, right? What the person's pivots did, this is the S&P. Now, this is based on their software and their calculations, so I can't alter this whatsoever. But as we go down, and I haven't updated this slide in a long time, but it's pretty powerful. We still utilize it to this day as far as back test results. But in the S&Ps, even back then, the life of, uh, looking back, this is a three-year back test study. Three years. This is what this represents. When the person's pivot said, hey, next week should be bullish, 79% of the time it was accurate. When it said it was going to be bearish, well, it was only accurate 69% of the times. Well above 50%, but maybe it might explain that the market was up. It wasn't down that many times. So it does have validity in using this tool that helps us to define the market condition. On a daily basis, you'll notice the statistics were slightly different. 79% on bullish, 71.5% on daily bearish. So it definitely shows that there's validity in using this tool. It was back testable. Um, we also did something that was a, a, a unique study using a highly correlated stock to the underlying market. And this is Apple. And back then, we also ran the uh, performance of if the person's pivot, blue is above gold, says that the week is supposed to be bullish. Was it bullish? Did the markets close above the pivot? 83% of the time in a three-year back test study, it said yes. And when it said bearish, 77% of the time, it was accurate. That was based on a weekly. But some of us trade intraday and end of day. And so what did the daily say? 79% was bullish. 71% accuracy on bearish. And those are what those statistics uh, are relevant for. So when you fast forward and you look at something like uh, the person's pivots, and this is the person's pivot indicator on thinkorswim. Now these are daily pivots. I've got a one hour chart and it's on Celgene. And one of the reasons I bring up Celgene is because we were looking for a heavy confluence of support near this 78, 79 handle. And as you can see, we've blown below all of that support. Now, in our trading room, and I, I'm not sure if we have any members that have been there, one of the things that we were looking for is if the pivot point, in this case, which is fuchsia, you can see it's fuchsia. If the market's truly bearish, it should not trade above the pivot. If the market's going to change from bearish to bullish, we should get a buy signal and trade and look for breakouts and buy signals above the daily pivot. And as you can see, we have not reached any of those criteria. Not at this point. Not, not yet. So while we're looking for a move, another thing that we have on our screen is the on balance volume indicator. And as you can see, we haven't gotten a, what I would expect to see is some kind of a exhaustion type sell-off, a lower, uh, maybe the market comes on a high volume sell-off and then forms a low and forms what we call bullish convergence, a bullish convergence pattern where the market may make a newer low, possibly make a newer low, but volume starts to move dry up. So I'd be looking for a bullish uh, move. This is the person's market catcher. This is a relative strength indicator. We would also want to see that sell gene while if it starts to move up, we would see it start to go from dark red to fuchsia, which means it's improving, and then trigger bright blue, which means it's outperforming its percent change to the upside, 
is outperforming the S&P 500. As you can clearly see, we haven't gotten a good volume reading, nor have we gotten an intraday um, movement in the relative strength versus the overall market. So the key here is pivots, man cannot live on pivots alone or PPS, but using the combination and then using testifiable evidence, is there maybe something that would attract institutions to get in on this? It would be when we start to see the relative strength outperform the broad market. And that's what we want to take the next two sessions to teach you guys about in as far as how to utilize these tools more accurately. Because these are, I think, some of the best top stock picking tools to help individual investors. As I mentioned, looking at Thinkorswim real quick, if we take a scan, and we can go and take a scan for how many buy signals generated uh, in all stocks, I can look at, I want to find out, on a day like today with the S&Ps up almost 19 points, with the Russell up 13, the NASDAQ up 39 in the futures, and the Dow almost up 300. I want to take a look at maybe how many stocks in the S&P 500 generated a fresh new buy signal. Um, today, um, it was kind of all over the place, except for a strong concentration in aerospace and defense today. Uh, we didn't get Exxon, finally, is getting into the groove here with the oil sector. But on a strong day like this, I'd also want to know what was the weakest stocks? Who generated a sell signal, right? I mean, if the market's going up and a stock on a day like today goes down, we want to certainly avoid that for buying opportunities like the plague. We want to certainly avoid it, right? So if you go to license study and you go down to sell signal, PPS sell signal, and hit scan, um, we have a kind of a couple here, Regeneron, Alexion, uh, Biotech, um, U.S. Steel, um, Raw Stores, which has earnings out this week. So not much in the S&P 500 was a strong, concentrated sell uh, nothing generated new, fresh, daily sell signals today. But if we go over to charts, I would be interested in looking at raw stores because it has earnings. So a lot of you guys like to, to take an earnings trade. And when you look at raw store, we're going to change this from an hour to a daily chart and say, and then go up to studies and let's edit studies. I've got daily pivots set up for a daily chart. So what do you say we change that, hit the, the little uh, cog wheel up there, the settings adjuster, and then go to time frame, and let's just change it to monthly and hit OK. Apply, hit OK. Now we've got monthly pivot. So here we have a situation where many of us could see that we have a pivot point down here around 80. The market's trading almost 81.93. Today we generated that little sell signal. That's what the scan revealed. Yet the relative strength is strong. It's outperforming the market. So with raw stores, the reason I'm, I'm doing this is because I told you we were looking at several considerations um, in the marketplace that we we were seeing a strong concentration of events take place ahead of earnings. And some were that we were getting high closed dojis on an intraday basis as well as a daily basis before earnings. And I'll give you a couple examples. John Deere was one. Chipotle Mexican Grill was another. We just had numerous names generate these uh, buy setups prior to the earnings reports. So I'm interested in, in scanning a couple days ahead to say, Gee, should I, if I wanted to look at some earnings or look at stock picking techniques, does Ross Store have any of those criteria? Well, at this point, the only thing it's got going for it is it did have a decent volume thrust to the upside. Its relative strength has outperformed the market um, and it has turned blue and has been positive against the overall market since the beginning or end of March. But as it is right now, we could see a, maybe a couple day pullback. And then we'll have to take a look at the this particular name um, because earnings are coming out on Thursday. I would say I'd, I'd probably want to see how this thing trades tomorrow and into Wednesday. So here is the relative strength as we head into 
uh, the next uh, or into tomorrow, and you can see, well, actually, the relative strength started to weaken over here. So we already started to weaken the market as it was up here. The person market catcher on a daily basis started to lose its positive momentum, as did the volume action. So therefore, this would not be a contender. What we want to see is the opposite of that. And this is what we did notice with, like, for example, John Deere. Ahead of earnings, we were seeing the relative strength improve. Let's take a look at the daily chart real quick. And this is what I'm referring to. We were in already with John Deere, a buy signal, and the relative strength was improving. That was the key ahead of earnings. When we take a look at Chipotle Mexican Grill, CMG, the relative strength was improving ahead of earnings. You'll notice it's hard to see it here, but let's go and switch gears real quick, gang. Here's John Deere. Now this is TradeStation, which we have it all color-coded for us. If you notice that this is the doji, which is bright blue, and the orange is my high-close doji pattern setup. We already know that the market on that close generated a high-close doji on improved relative strength with increase in volume. So some of the technical tools that we have are illustrating that says they were setting up a, a systematic signal ahead of earnings. Here's what CMG looked like, by the way. The same type of scenario. When I said there's a systematic coincidence of patterns coming together, it's not just one, but a systematic coincident factor. Here's your high close doji as the relative strength began to get more positive as the volume started to increase ahead of earnings. Somebody knew. I'm not saying that everyone knew. But a few select people knew and were watching for the trigger of a high closed doji as the relative strength started to turn positive. So do you think that we're looking for those considerations moving forward? And then the answer would be, you bet your bottom dollar we are. So what we're looking for as far as types of signals to improve our stock peaking capabilities are certain bottom patterns with indicator convergences. So indicator is highlighted here, and I think I just shared with you, we're looking for maybe a positive move with the relative strength PMC indicator. We're looking for a positive move with volume considerations. We're also looking for continuation patterns or breakouts from consolidation. We're looking for markets that are in established uptrends with rising moving averages. And then last but not least, these last two bullet points is what we're going to go over in a little bit more detail next week. Closes above and below what we call a last conditional change. What is a last conditional change? Well, if we take a look on a, just a, I think we'll highlight this a little bit clearer here. When you take a look at a chart, and I thought this would be clearer for us, when we clear resistance, we have what's called a last conditional change resistance. It's this gray line. And when the market closes on a PPS signal, if we get a close greater than a resistance line, it helps give positive confirmation. We have what's called a last conditional change breakout. Very positive to help us say, we didn't just get a buy signal. We have a buy signal above a last conditional change resistance. How good and reliable is that? It's so good, we actually have a scan for it. And that's called our trilogy setup, because we scan for stocks that are generally breaking out above last conditional change resistance. It helps say, hey, I like your PPS. I like the person's pivots. But is the market breaking out above a resistance level? And so if you notice here, you'll see where it actually is blinking. And you have last conditional change bull, last conditional change bear. So we're looking for stocks that are giving us buy signals above resistance before earnings reports. And Intuit just did that for us for going into uh, earnings. So that is one right there. And of course, Intuit 
has earnings out tomorrow. All right. So some neat things about how we qualify and quantify specific buy and sell signals. So I wanted to review. When I say I'm looking for buy signals on bullish convergence, what we're looking for is, and this would be in the case of sell gene. We don't have a buy signal, but what we're looking for is the condition. As we get near a pivot support, or maybe it gets below a one level and breaks through it, we're looking for buy signals near that area. And what would the buy signals be? Well, obviously, PPS or a high closed doji would work for me. But I'd also want to see an uptick in a convergence in the indicator. So what do we mean by a convergence? What I mean by that is this. As you can see, the corresponding low. This is point number two. This is point number two on the charts. This was the previous low. And this was point number one on the charts. From the first low, or corresponding point number one, point number two is absolutely lower. The on-balance volume is also lower. This volume indicator is a special tool that we created, which is only available on TradeStation. But it's, this is the one I was talking about that measures the rate of change in terms of percents. So this is a different way of looking at the market. And it does help us to illustrate changes in, in volume action in terms of percent rather than overall actual price movement. Okay, so with that said, how can it benefit you if you're just using Thinkorswim or Trade Navigator? On balance volume is a good tool. Person's Market Catcher is an exceptional tool, and it helps us to define if this is a a weak low, in other words, an exhausted low, so that maybe perhaps people capitulated out their position and it's getting ready for a reversal to the upside. Markets that form bullish convergence with relative strength and volume have the capability of seeing sharp, fast recoveries to the upside. It is under those conditions that I like to look for buying opportunities with relative strength identification buy signals. All right? So that's, that's part of what we're talking about under volume and uh, PMC, person market catcher convergence. So this is just, I mean, if you just take a simple look-see, as the stock price is moving down, the relative strength is getting less negative. It's, we're seeing the lows get higher. So as this stock was moving down, all of a sudden, you see the gray lines in the sand? Subtly, devil's in the detail, they say, the market closes greater than a old resistance and we have bullish convergence. In other words, the market made newer lows, but the indicators not. And the volume was coming in. People were accumulating whatever this was prior to the big move to the upside. This is uh, AAP, so this has got nothing to do. And by the way, this is from last year. So this has got nothing to do with this earnings report. It's just the same type of pattern with the same type of considerations and quit co coincidental factors. And that's what we've been addressing and looking for in this marketplace. So when you look at the opposite is true for divergence patterns. So we see why do traders look for divergences either in the relative strength. If a price makes a newer high and the relative strength is weakening, that does not tell me that is a very strong move. It tells me that the market is getting ready or is vulnerable, keyword, for a major decline, which in this case, not only was it vulnerable for a decline, but it also had a nice setup where it generated, as the market was closing, a low closed OG, which is why that's purple, and it had a PPS sell signal. So as markets make new highs, they're giving you warning signals that the market's making a new high with deteriorating volume patterns and the relative strength is weakening against the overall market. I don't know about you, but I find that to be, and that's what I kind of look for, is a sense of whether or not I should be in a stock, out of a stock, or avoiding a landmine. It's, it's as simple as that. So can we program stuff like this? And the answer is absolutely. I mean, you've seen what goes into algo systems. I'm sure there's all kinds of things. We've got time and price tools, moving averages, pivots. 
I guess you could program Fibonacci in automatically. Indicators, cycles, people, a lot of people are using cycle analysis still, and, and, and I still do as well. Uh, seasonality has a lot to do with cycles, by the way. Um, volume action, we've got trend, um, VWAP, bid ask, percent change, standard deviations. I mean, there's all kinds of considerations that we can use. And then we have conditions. What's the condition of the market? Who, who's in charge of the market? You can see that with the commodities by the commitment of traders report. Are hedge funds long and the small specs short? That's not a good um, outlook for small speculators. Advanced decline analysis, looking at the breadth of the market. Looking at our volatility, our ATR. Is it expanding or contracting? Right now, the S&Ps, by the way, is contracting. In October, we are at a nine-handle ATR in the S&Ps. At the beginning of March, we were at 63. As of today, we're back down to around 24. So we've gone from nothing, nine points in the E-mini S&Ps in October on a daily basis, to 63, back down to 24. So at least it's the, the, the at trading daily ranges are starting to, as I said, testifiably contract. We're starting to see daily volatility come down. Seasonality and relative strength. Now, what about automated strategies? And as I was talking about, when we take a look at automated strategies, this is an old system that I had. And this was based off a high closed doji. And it had a, as you can see, it was using a one to one risk reward ratio. The stop was the red dots and the profit target was the green dots. We could literally say, get me in, put my stop and get me out. And it was a pretty robust system that we used for S&Ps on a 15 minute basis. Obviously, this is when the market had about a 20 handle ATR and we still were able to use those type of parameters. But friends, should you be using those type of parameters in the environment that we just went through this year? The answer is no. Things change. And what changes? Certainly not high closed OGs. Um, certainly we get those all the time still. And we just shared with you high closed OGs that happen in individual equities. So what needs to change? We need to adjust our risk reward ratio for the conditions that we're in. That's what we need to change. So I want to share with something with you. This is a, a little model on Apple. This is a daily. This is Apple. This is a daily chart. So we can take out signals uh, and automate the sell signals. Uh, we can reverse them when we get the sell signal. We can reverse those and go long when a profit target is met or trail the stop and use the different functions, right? But here's the question, and this is what we're going to go through. And so if you're not familiar with what we're going to do, this is a two-part session starting today and then again on follow-up on Wednesday, May 30th. What I want to follow up, though, is how to better understand indicators and the dynamics of markets. I know a lot of you are familiar with the term a V bottom, right? How many people have heard of a V bottom versus a rounding top, right? Uh, or have you heard the phrase that tops take longer to form than bottoms, right? Have we heard of that? So if markets if they take a while to go down, when they do go down, they go down fast and furious. Uh, market bottoms, people rush in to buy because they're cheap, and so you see an immediate recovery. And then as the market defines a trend, you always see this really like hyperbolic blow off at the end of a move, right? Versus a rounding top, the market conditions, when a market goes down, it doesn't just knock on the door and say, come on in, we're going to let you get short so you can make some quick money. It's kind of like, you know, here's a market, a V bottom, right? Market recovers, and it starts to go into maybe some people would call that a, a potential cup and handle pattern. It breaks out, and then it, it, it explodes in a fast and furious method as time goes on. It gets into that late stage rally. So the question begs, do you have to hold on to longs more than you hold on to a short? 
Are there dynamic differences in your holding time frames in longs versus shorts? Does your risk reward ratios change? Longs versus shorts. Is that a good question that you guys would like to know about? I mean, every market's different. I mean, we can't compare cell gene to Regeneron because one may come out with a, a solution of some medical drug and some one might not even be in the, the, the cancer curing business. One might be doing diabetes. So that's a bad uh, analysis to compare one particular biotech company to another. But what about indices or maybe volatility or markets that, that are kind of that trade under the same conditions? So like crude oil. I mean, we could look at crude oil and say buy signals versus sell signals. If this is true, markets go up faster and they go down, then this would be something we would want to explore. And just to share with you, this is a, um, a product that we came out with last year. This was our uh, signature. It's an algo optimizing uh, strategy. It takes an account for us to maintain a trading system. Now, I want to share with you this chart because this is pretty, um, this is pretty compelling. If you ever compelling information for you, if you ever seen my YouTube videos, I generally give out the VXX system, the strategy which is based off of this particular graph here. This is a private one of settings, but I do want to share with you what you see on the charts. This is the VXX. All three of these have a back test performance that go back. If I go back, I want to just show that you can see this since 2010. Okay? Double check to make sure I'm didn't get a senior moment. 2010. 2010. So all of these charts that you see in front of you are all from t January of 2010 to today. Now, look at the strategy equity performance. This is 997,000. This is 764,000. This is 529,000. They all have different performances. Well, the first major difference that you're going to see is this particular one you'll see went long here, and this one did not go long, and this one did not go long. So this is a long and a short. This is short only, and this is short only. All right? That's the big difference. Both of these are short only. Now, if you look at the signals, you can almost see that they almost get in each and every one, they go short, darn close to the high of the move. They all three take profits. The market generates another sell signal, and they all three go short again. But one gets out a little late. One gets out pretty decently. This one gets out pretty decently as well. And then they are all short again. This one went short, and it got out today, right on the close. This one was short, got out a little early, went short again today, and got stopped out with a small loss. This one went short, and it got out just a little bit different. It got out at the early in the morning. So what is the difference between these three performances? Well, this is long and short, and all three have different exit strategies. They all have the same type of entry, but they all have different exit strategies. What does that have to do with anything? Well, a lot. Let's take a look at something really I found to be extremely informational for everyone and one thing that we're going to talk about a little bit more. This is the one, if we go to Format set Strategies, you'll notice where it says Person Algo System 17. There's been 17 versions that have come out since the original version. 17. What we've done, not to make it better, but to optimize, but to, to look at optimization functions and to back test to get better information in the markets in which we're trading. Since I think every one of you believe that this is a insane computerized generated world and it's not going to get easier. And so therefore we want to find out is there a holding period better and I'm just going to cut to the chase. We're going to go over here to format and I'm going to scale down here. I'm going to show you something here 
without revealing everything that's been built into this. But look at this is a PPS cell signal. All right? And if it's on 1, it means it's turned on. 0 means off. 1 is uh, true, 0 false. So, or on, off. Okay? You'll notice that in the 10 or 9 or 8 year history, excuse me, every time you take a PPS cell signal, the optimization comes out that you get better, cleaner risk reward ratios at 7.5 to 1. Is that amazing? Seven and a half to one. So that one to one risk reward ratio, if you're taking a cell signal, maybe buy signals might be one to one, but a cell signal with the right trailing stop, at least for this product, is seven and a half to one. And that's a PPS cell signal. Now here's what's amazing. Here's a low closed OG. So if any of you know about my work with the low closed OG, it comes earlier, it has a high probability. There's a certain holding period that we have, but look at the optimization results for the low closed OG. You will notice it is three and a half to one. So different cell signals provide different risk reward ratios. That is pretty amazing. Now, one of these, this down here, you will notice this is another function. How many of these cell signals provided better trades, less risk, higher probability when combined with a moving average and a specific time period? So if you have a PPS cell signal and you threw up a 60 period on a 60 minute moving average, this is saying this particular model does exceedingly well in its defining its risk reward ratio and taking those signals using an additional filter of a moving average of a 60 minute time period. When we did it and optimized it for a low closed OG, we found out that an eight period moving average generated better results. So it absolutely shows we had better results in defining a cell signal, defining which cell signal, and what type of confirmation did we get, and was it did we get better results with a moving average component throw, thrown over the market. So when we had maybe low closed doji triggers, if the low closed doji, which in this case did not fire off because either the risk was too great or the mechanics of the um, moving average did not meet, then it didn't take the trade. But as you can see, it, has, it takes other trades. And nicely, too. So here's a low closed doji, and it says LCD. So, you know, it is going short, and it went for a high probability short versus the low probability that it didn't take over here. So let me help define this again for you guys so that you may find this very appealing. Uh-oh. Bear with me a second. Yes. All right. Oof. Sorry about that, guys. Um, here's the low close. How do I know that was a low close doji? Because the bar was purple. Well, let's wait. And hopefully this comes back up for us. So in defining the building an algo and a trading system and a trading strategy, a lot of work can go into defining what its best performance is and the relevancy and the frequency of signals. So this is what we are looking at right here before we had a low closed doji. The doji closed below the low of the doji and so therefore the criteria that said it'd be best if it closes under an eight period moving average with low closed dojis. Well obviously it, that must not have happened because it didn't fire off. But one fired off down here and there's the low closed doji and it definitely fired off, and it generated a nice little profitable trade being short the VXX. This is the volatility index. So the point is that every different sell signal might need uh, a better risk-reward outlay, and yet we'll be running and finding out more information as we get through and 
discover the opposite side of that, which would be for longs, as we come into next week. So this is what's really been exciting in our world here at Persons Planet, and of course here, rather than uh, as, as we build into looking for the right stock to trade, the right sectors to trade, but also define the right profit loss targets, right? Define a better setup. Is it based on convergence, divergence patterns? What is the, the MO of the market? And so I think, is the market best to take longs and shorts, or is the market best to only take um, short only? So this is the uh, equity curve on a, a, a business model using, and even though we don't have every trade's not a winner, as you can see, to even today's action, the performance summary is dynamic. How dynamic? Uh, periodic returns based on a, a starting account of $100,000, um, you know, year to date, it's this particular model only takes shorts, on, it's only short only, it's, it's only short only, it's only takes shorts, this model, right? So it's a, it's a pretty compelling uh, return, the performance summary of short only bars uh, almost has a two to one Profit target, it's traded 723 times uh, in the last eight years. So your amount of time in the market is uh, half of what it was. So your rate of return and, and efficiency of market return is awesome in this model. Eight years, four months is the trading period, and it's only been in the market for four years, nine months. Uh, drawdown is within a reasonable expectation, 16 uh, thousand off a hundred thousand dollars, sixteen percent drawdown factor. So for any serious trader, by utilizing uh, again a system that says, you know what, if it's um, if I got a sell signal, go short for me, and if I'm wrong, get me the hell out of dodge. So you want something that can cut your losses pretty quick, and obviously we want something that can let the profits ride, right, and be on the right side of the market. So I think it's best that we say, gee, there's a lot of systems out there, there's a lot of trade ideas out there, but I think it's really informative from where you're sitting to say, listen, is there some signals that get more money than others? Does, a, does the market have a quicker performance on buy signals with convergence or not? Do sell signals provide better performance, meaning are they more profitable if you get a sell signal over or under a moving average filter um, or a last conditional change concept, which is what we've built in. And you can see almost every single chart. These gray uh, lines are last conditional change. The, uh, the same function is in the system, which is built into this algo optimizer number, our version number 17. But as you can see, we've taken this to new heights of finding testifiable evidence, what's better for uh, signals? What kind of signal? PPS, high closed OG, uh, is it best to take cells only, longs only? And that's the kind of information that we wanted to find out. And then we could say, hey, by the way, maybe it's better when the markets go down, they go down a lot faster, but your holding period is less. Maybe when the market goes up, the rate of return's a little bit better, but the holding period is longer because it takes longer for markets to go up than it does for them to go down. But in, an, in the ongoing constant battle of trying to find out is this a bull market or a bear market, I think it's best to look at the characteristics of each individual market and the conditions of whether it's going up or down. And that I think, I, I hope are, I'm making sense uh, to you guys because this is all a part of how to effectively and, and successfully build a, uh, a trading model. Now this is just a, an example of a trading system that's just has a lot of different signals. You can see where it says maximum bars. Now if we used the original version which combined both longs and shorts or results of the holding period, you can see a lot of times the max bars, uh, it got out right before the market, you know, uh, not only was it long, it got out, but it went short. It gets out right before lows are met. I mean, this is a pretty decent, you can see a lot of really nice setups here 
And as you can see, this particular uh, system, the equity curve, this was last year, of course, but the example is if there's volatility and you have a system that is able to capture good signals with risk-reward ratios, the question begs, are, would we be getting better performance with a higher percent trailing stop or a lower percent trailing stop? In other words, if you're long the market, do I have a tighter stop or a looser stop versus if I'm short the market, do I have a tighter stop or a looser market? Because if it takes longer for the market to go up and a shorter term holding period for the market to go down, that's information that's going to help me to get a better profit objective. And thus, therefore, I'm going to able to have better return of my equity and make smarter and better trades. And that's what we're after, gang. So I think whether it's the high close, the low close, whether it's a, a confirmation over or above, above or below a moving average, those are very dynamic uh, issues that instead of saying, I don't think that's any good, I can run a back test and find out, oh no, that is good. And which type of moving average? What time period should that be? At this point, some people would guess and say, maybe a two period or an eight period or 20 period or 200 day moving average. Well, we have a, a function that allows us to figure this all out. So that's what I find to be amazing about technology nowadays and where we stand about um, finding out more information about the markets that we're trading since we do have a just insane amount of new products and dynamics that have changed in our world. In fact, guys, let me just double check something with you. Here's our sector ETFs. I mean, you know, for the most part, they're the same ones, right? But here's what's not the same ones over the last 20 years. We have more leveraged ETFs, right? We have more or less, or we have one less uh, volatility product, but we have volatility products and exchange traded notes and ETN like the VXX to trade. Um, we have subsectors uh, that we can trade that are more volatile than ever before, such as steel stocks, right? I mean, we didn't really look at steel stocks to be that volatile in the last five years or prior to that. Uh, financials, we have broker-dealers that are all over the place, insurers, regional banks now, and the regular financials, large banks. We have all different ways of trading each sector and subsector. In fact, so many new products besides we have, of course, the increase in semiconductors and competitions. It's no longer a handful like it used to be, as you all know, with Intel, NVIDIA, and the list goes on and on. But here's one of the things, if I could just get down to the basics, I mean, we have all of these subsectors and these sectors to look at that are all being heavily traded. And when I say heavily, here's utilities. Um, and, or excuse me, where did I have utilities? I had it somewhere. I must have passed it up. Um, let me go up to here and get back. Here are the utilities right here. Look at the range, the volume. 3.3 million in Duke Energy. 4 million today in um, PG&E. Uh, 8 million. I mean, these are some pretty good volume readings in a daily basis, right? Um, so these markets are actually kind of moving. And look at the ATRs. A buck over here, a buck 26, a buck 60, $2.44. In next era energy, we really never saw that type of volatility in utilities before. It's crazy. Anyway, here's the other market segment that's brand new for all of us to trade. Um, well, maybe not all of you, but for the last, I mean, most of you, if you grew up in the 70s, may have gotten busted for smoking pot. Now we're trading pot stocks. You know what I'm I mean, I'm not saying that anyone, you know, allegedly, Maybe. Allegedly, you know about it. Maybe we, you read about it somewhere, I'm sure. But now we're trading marijuana uh, stocks. And, and so we can classify all of these uh, names. I mean, I've got Scott's Miracle Grow because it's in the pot stock sector because apparently you can't grow good pot without Scott's Miracle Grow. At least if I was growing pot for a living, I'd want a Miracle Grow the Dickens out of it myself. So anyway, I've classified that as a, um, a pot stock. And then you got crypto FX, another area that, that is uh, a new boon to our, our way of living and, and trading style. 
So a lot of these names, and yes, Microsoft is in there, um, and, and of course, uh, Overstock uh, is in there, Riot Blockchain, which isn't really, uh, well, neither here nor there. Uh, but anyway, these are all the different uh, markets that we can trade, and, and, and I think that's what I mean by we have so many different new things to trade and ways to trade. We need something special to testifiably say, hey, is this worth me being in the market or not? And what is the rate of return that I can get? And, and, and look at maybe is it a tradable market that I could take advantage of? All of that information is something we now have at our disposal. Anyway, we're going to have a follow-up webinar and share with you guys next week and do a little bit more on our PMC indicator through Thinkorswim, how we run these scans a little bit uh, more efficiently, and then armed ourselves with some um, ways of trading the market. I think you guys will have a better understanding uh, moving forward of how utilizing these uh, indicators is going to help you in stock picking at least going forward in the rest of this year. And I promise you it's still going to be an interesting year, whether it's trading um, commodities like gold or whether it's trading even silver, which is amazing because uh, last but not least, if you look at silver prices, you know, relative to gold, you know, silver really didn't go anywhere. I don't know if anyone noticed that. It, uh, one of my uh, favorite setups is when we get a buy signal above the pivot, and this happens to be the pivot there. If silver gets back above pivot, look at the volume as uh, uh, relates to the silver market. Silver is going sideways, and the volume is in an accumulative mode. Silver could outperform gold if there is a recovery in a very short period of time. I think everyone may want to take a look at that, or for you equity traders, you may also want to take or spot or, or take a look at SLV, which is the exchange traded note on silver futures themselves. It doesn't look as dynamic with the, the volume. The uh, relative strength versus the S&Ps is starting to improve. That's the fuchsia color. So I'd be keeping my eye out on SLV only because of the fact that the silver futures are getting quite a volume surge and it outperformed relative to gold. So if there's a recovery, watch for silver to rebound a little more or faster than gold. So we'll find out how that pans out. We want to be watching for this in the next week, and we'll have some more thoughts and ideas for you guys next Wednesday. That would be May 30th. Now, I think today gave some insights to what trading strategies can be developed, what you guys are capable of building yourself, and how it, products like this is beneficial for individual retail customers. With that said, I thank everyone for being here. That concludes our time, and we'll see you here next Wednesday. Don't forget, you need to sign up for that presentation. You'll get an email in the, May, uh, in the mail. It's Wednesday, May 30th. Thank you all for being here. Until then, we'll see you. Thank you.